Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to continue our study through the book of Hebrews, which means that we're going to continue to talk about the superiority of Christ because that's the theme or the subject of this book. I would remind you that the Holy Spirit inspired this book for Jewish or Hebrew Christians who were tempted to fall away from the faith back into Judaism because the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians. Hebrews then was written so that they would persevere so that they would persevere as the result of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of Judaism. So that they would persevere as the result of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of of their Scripture. So that they would persevere as the result of seeing Christianity as true Judaism, as fulfilled Judaism so that they would persevere as the result of seeing the superiority of Christ. That's why the author wrote what he wrote. In chapters 1 and 2, it was about seeing the superiority of Christ first in the early verses of chapter 1 over the prophets, but then especially in the rest of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2, it was about seeing the superiority of Christ over the angels. In chapter 3, it was about seeing the superiority of Christ over, the, over Moses. And then in the first part of chapter 4, it was about seeing the superiority of Christ over Joshua. Beginning here in chapter 4, verse 14, it's about seeing the superiority of Christ over Aaron. Or we could say over the Old Testament priesthood, over the high priest of the Old Testament. So that's what I want you to be looking for, and that's what I'm confident that you will find and see in our passage that begins in verse 14 of chapter 4. Look there with me and follow along as I begin to read. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, and with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
in this passage and the passages that immediately follow it in the book of Hebrews, Christ is contrasted with the priesthood of Aaron, with the priesthood of the Old Covenant. And this contrast is presented towards the end of demonstrating the superiority of Christ. The superiority of His priesthood. That's why verse 14 speaks of Him as being our great high priest. And we might should understand that as our greater high priest. Greater is in superior. Well, to understand this, to understand the priesthood of Christ and its superiority, we must first understand the Old Testament priesthood. And to understand that means that we understand the office of the priesthood and the function of the priest, of the high priest under the Old Covenant. Well, this is a great passage for helping us understand that. Because that's exactly what is explained to us in summary form in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5. So look again to chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. You see, the Old Testament priest the high priest of the Old Covenant, they had to be men to represent man. They had to be human to represent humans. The reason we speak of Adam as being our representative is because we come from him. We are what we are because he was what he was. So these priests of the Old Testament had to be one of us to represent us, or had to be one of them, the people of that day, to represent them to God. They served as mediators between the people they represented and God, and there had to be an intermediary. There was a need for mediation because things were not right between people and God. People in Adam and then later on in their own actions had disobeyed God and it created a separation or discord between them and the God who had made them in His image. So you see these Old Testament priests had to represent the people, the sinful people, in bringing them before a sinless, holy God. And the way that they did this, according to verse 1, was by offering gifts and sacrifices for sins. Things weren't right between the people and God. God was justifiably at wrath or in anger against, holy, righteous, justified anger against the people. And so these sacrifices had to be made, these offerings had to be made by the Old Testament priest so that propitiation could be made between the people and God. That's a word we've seen already in the book of Hebrews. We've seen it elsewhere in the Bible and talked about it other times. It means to take away the wrath, to satisfy the wrath of God. And that's what these sacrifices did, at least symbolically. This took place at the mercy seat. You remember the mercy seat was in connection to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant uh, resided first in the tabernacle and then later on in the more permanent structure, the temple. And it was here that the presence of God lived among His people. But the people could not come into the presence of God, could they? Because of their sin. They had to have one to go into the presence of God on their behalf to offer something that would appease this God who had been so terribly offended. And that was the function, the office of the priesthood. 
And it's not like all the priests got to go into the most holy place, to the presence of God. Only the high priest got to go, and it's not like he got to go any time he wanted to. He only got to go one time a year. That one time of year, on the Day of Atonement, he would offer sacrifices or a sacrifice, take the blood of a sacrifice there and place it on the mercy seat where the people who had sinned received mercy through the work, the mediatorial work of this priest on their behalf once a year. This went on year after year because even that work did not satisfy the wrath of God permanently. Look at verse 2. It says there, He, the priest, the high priest, can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So on the one hand, the high priest had to be a human to represent humans, but another qualification for his being human, the high priest also had to be human to sympathize with humans. He had to represent the people, but you also wanted one who could identify with the people, who could sympathize with them, or as it says here in verse 2, so that he could deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, so that he could deal gently with sinners, the very sinners that he represented. If you have offended one who is unimaginably higher than you, and you need and call on someone to represent you before that great one that you have offended, you want the one who is representing you to be sympathetic to you, don't you? You don't want them to be self-righteous. You don't want them to be harsh towards you. You don't want them to be condemning towards you. You want to know that they care for you and understand you in representing you. Well, the high priest could do this because he was a sinner too. That's what verse 2 means. It says he, like they, was beset with weakness. He was weak morally. He was weak physically. He was weak emotionally and mentally. He was weak spiritually just like they were. He had just been called to a different function than them. It wasn't like he was better than they were. Or they were sinners and he was not. It had to be this way so that he could identify with their struggle. And every high priest should have been very gentle with the people because at the same time that he would have offered a sacrifice for them once a year, he also had to offer a sacrifice for himself before he could offer a sacrifice for them. He, beyond all of the people, should have understood that I need propitiation too. I need something to satisfy God with me, to make me right with God. I need a sacrifice just like they do. That's why verse 3 in chapter 5 says, because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. Now look at verse 4. It says, And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So we find in these four verses two qualifications for a high priest. He had to be a human to represent humans and to sympathize with the humans that he represented, the people he represented. The second qualification is he had to be appointed. And if you were paying attention, you would note that that word was used in verse 1 as well. It spoke of the high priest as being appointed. He had to be called by God to this office which means he had to be chosen by God to do this. That's the way it worked with Aaron. That's what it said in verse 4. Aaron did not become the high priest because he said one day, you know what I think I'd like to do with my life? I'd like to be a priest. I'd like to be the high priest, in fact. I'd like to be the guy that gets to go into the very presence of God once a year. That's not how it worked. 
his sons after him and the priesthood after him was not made of people who decided, you know, took one of those vocational tests and decided that the number one job that he should go after in life was to be a priest. Well, they became priests because they were chosen by God. They were appointed by God to this office. On Wednesday nights, we've been studying through 1 Samuel. And we're at the end of the the reign of Saul as the first human king of Israel. You might remember that one of the main reasons that Saul would lose that kingdom and be rejected by God is he took upon himself wrongly the office of the priesthood and offered a sacrifice when Samuel didn't show up according to his, his clock. So we see in Saul, and there are other Old Testament examples, that you can't just be a priest and function like a priest because you want to or you couldn't. It didn't work that way. Well, those four verses give us a picture of the Old Testament priesthood, of the office and the function of the high priest. And the reason that that is written about at the beginning of chapter 5, and therefore the reason that I talk about it, is it sets the stage for understanding the priesthood of Christ, which is the real subject of this passage and the passages that follow. He talks here about the Old Testament priesthood so that we can see the contrast between that priesthood and the priesthood of Christ, which is what he really wants to talk about and does. He wrote about that Old Testament priesthood so that we could see the superiority of the priesthood of Christ over that priesthood. And that's what we see in the rest of this text. And we see it in six ways. We find the first of those in chapter 4, verse 14. Look back there with me, if you would. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. When it speaks of Christ, it's high priest, passing through the heavens, that's a reference to the ascension of Christ, who is returning back to the glory which He had previously had before the incarnation, after His death and resurrection. It refers to His ascension to heaven, where He has entered, and I want you to tune in really closely here, and pick up on the contrast that's being made where he has entered the heavenly temple. Where he has offered himself as a sacrifice. His own blood at the heavenly mercy seat. Where he has fulfilled and brought to an end the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's why in our order of service, we no longer have sacrifice the lamb. That's why you're not bringing pigeons with you to church. Or your young heifers, your best ones. Because Christ, in entering the heavenly temple, has fulfilled and brought to an end the Old Testament sacrificial system. He was what all of it pointed to, including the priesthood which He has fulfilled and brought an end to as well, with a one-time sacrifice, once and for all. Not a sacrifice that had to be repeated every year. A sacrifice that was made once, that was presented once, and that was it because it was sufficient. Christ has ascended to heaven where He is now seated permanently, because His work is through. It is finished. It has been paid in full. He is seated at the right hand of the Father where He lives to make intercession for us. That's His session. His high priestly session on our behalf. And I want you to think about Him that way as you think about Christ being seated at the right hand of our Father he is seated there as our high priest, our representative, 
our sacrifice. That's why I say that he's a superior priest. That he is is a superior priesthood. The first way that we see his superiority over Aaron and Old Testament priesthood is he is a superior representative. A better, a much better representative. The ultimate representative. And I say that he's a superior representative because his ministry, his work was superior. It was better. He offered a superior sacrifice, right? He doesn't have to repeat it. It's done. That's a superior sacrifice. He offered it in a superior temple, right? Not an earthly tabernacle, not an earthly temple that would pass away, and it did, but the heavenly one on which the earthly one has been modeled. It's as if the author of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit through him, is saying to those people that this was originally written to, why would you go back to what pointed to Christ? Why would you go back to the shadow when the reality has come? Why would you go back to inferior sacrifices? Why would you go back to an inferior priesthood? And the question for us today is why would we, for any reason, even the most horrible of reasons, even the most traumatic of reasons, even the most difficult of reasons, why would we, for any reason, fall away from this one? From this high priest. Look at verse 14 again. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. He speaks here to the identity of Jesus as he already has earlier in the book of Hebrews. Jesus, the human name of our Savior, Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of David, one of us, had to be. Why did He have to be? Because our representative has to be one of us. That's why the incarnation was a necessity. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But we also see here that He was more than just the Son of David. More than just a son of man, more than, if you will, a son of Aaron in the sense of being a priest. He was the Son of God. Our high priest is a divine high priest. Our high priest is a man, but he's not merely a man. Amen? He's the God-man. That's what makes him a superior priest. His priesthood superior. And it's the second way that we see the superiority of Christ over Aaron in the Old Testament priesthood. He has a superior identity. Man and God. So I ask again, why would we fall away from this one? Why would we ever fall away and abandon and reject this high priest? In the words of Peter, who else would we go to? Who else is there to go to? I look at verse 15. It says, Therefore we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So in this verse, we find a third way in which we see the superiority of Christ over Aaron in the Old Testament priesthood, and it is that He offers superior sympathy. Now, the high priest had to be a man so that he could sympathize with the people that he represented. But the, the sympathy of Christ is a superior sympathy. When it comes to our weaknesses, it's a superior sympathy. Because as we saw there in verse 15, He has been tempted in every respect as we are. 
Surely that wasn't true of any merely human high priest. You know, over the years, people come to me and share problems, and I can identify with problems in general, but I can't identify with every single problem that people go through. There are others that can. Some of us share issues in common. We receive so much comfort and mutual encouragement from people who have walked where we've walked or where we're walking. But Christ's priesthood is superior because He's been tempted in every respect as we are. Because He was one of us. He was the ultimate one of us. He was a human like we are. Think about that. God becoming a man just like us. If you doubt that Jesus has been tempted and therefore can understand our weaknesses, our temptations, our struggles, then I would take you back to the wilderness where He was tempted by Satan at the beginning of His ministry. Do you not think that was real temptation? Do you not think that would qualify Him to understand you and I as we are tempted? None of us are important enough to be tempted individually and personally by Satan. I'm guessing the most important of us would be maybe the domain of some junior demon. At best, maybe a freshman. But Lieutenant Demon wasn't sent to the wilderness to deal with Jesus. The prince of the demons was... Jesus understands, therefore, our weaknesses. In addition to His temptation in the wilderness, think about Gethsemane. You know, Jesus had a garden temptation just like Adam and Eve, didn't He? One that was far more profound, one that was far more significant, one that was far more difficult. We read in the account of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane on the night before His death, that his soul was deeply distressed, that he thought he wouldn't make it, that when he prayed, he sweat as he prayed, and he sweat drops of blood. He poured out his heart repeatedly before his father as he faced that cup of God's wrath that he would have to drink. Father, if there's any other way, take this cup, let this cup pass from me. But if this is what it takes, this is what I'll be willing to do, whatever your will is. And though we aren't told about other temptations in the life of Jesus, at least in the gospel accounts, in passages like this, we are taught that surely his temptations were not limited to the wilderness and the garden. Day after day as we are, Jesus must have been tempted in his everyday life Yet here's the difference. Yet without sin. And I've heard people say, well, he can't really identify with us if he didn't sin. Well, that's not to be crude. Hogwash. What's more difficult? To give in to temptation or to resist it? What is more difficult, brother and sister? To take the easy way out and disobey? Or to pick up your cross and follow Christ and obey. We all know what's more difficult, right? Who's the better one to sympathize with us? The one who's failed worse than we have? No, it's the one who has succeeded where we have failed. Therefore, I say that we see His superiority because in Him we find a superior sympathy. Look at verse 16. It says there, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In this verse, we find a fourth way that shows us the superiority of Christ over Aaron and over the Old Testament priesthood, and that is that Christ in His priesthood provides us with superior access. And I don't just mean superior access for Himself, though that was true. The high priest, one high priest at a time, got to go into the presence of God one time a year. How much access does Christ, the high priest, have to the presence of God? I mean, He's like 7-Eleven. Never closed. 
like Waffle House. I mean, you can eat at Waffle House anytime. It's permanent access to the Father. But I'm not speaking here about His superior access. What I'm really talking about is He has provided superior access for us, for the people that He represents. Check this out. He brings us to where He is. He brings us into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, and not just the earthly one. He brings us to the heavenly, most holy place. Christ brings us, every one of us who are trusting on Him for salvation, to the mercy seat. He brings us to the throne. He brings us into the very presence of God. He tore the veil for us, making a way for us beyond the veil, behind the veil. That's something the old covenant saints never had. It's something the old covenant priest never provided. Now I want you to skip down to verse 5 in chapter 5. It says here, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, here we find the fifth way in which we see the superiority of Christ over Aaron and the Old Testament priesthood, and that is he received a superior appointment. Remember we talked earlier about the qualifications for priests? They had to be human to represent. Christ was a superior representative. But we also talked about a second qualification. Had to be appointed. Couldn't just choose it for yourself. Well, His appointment was superior. His calling was superior. In verse 5, the author of Hebrews quotes from the second psalm. Verse 7, he's already quoted from it. Once before in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Well, borrowing from that, since he quotes from it again here in chapter 5, I would ask this question. To which of the priests, to which of the Old Testament priests did God ever say, You are my son? Which one? I'm waiting. Which one did he ever say, Today I have begotten you. You are my one-of-a-kind, unique son. Well, you know what the answer is, don't you? None of them. I mean, if you're thinking about it, you're going to have to keep thinking about it because there are no examples of that in the Old Testament. And it brings us back to a point that I made earlier, that was made earlier in the text, the second way in which we see the superiority of Christ over Aaron, the Old Testament priesthood, remember I said he has a superior identity. He's the Son of God in addition to being the Son of Man. And he was declared by the Father to be his Son at his baptism. This is my Son. At his transfiguration. This is my Son. What he's really talking about here and making reference to is he was declared to be the begotten, only begotten Son of God in his resurrection. I think that's the today that he's referencing here. And I base that on a passage like Romans chapter 1 verse 4, which says Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection or in his resurrection from the dead. So we see in that, him being identified as the Son of God, that his appointment to the priesthood is a superior appointment. Look at verse 6. It says, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I also say that the appointment of Christ to the priesthood is superior because it's an eternal appointment. Says he's a priest forever. Was Aaron a priest forever? 
or the sons of Aaron priests forever? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Were any of the Old Testament priests priests forever? First of all, there was an age that they couldn't serve after. And then all of them died. Why they kept having to have more priests. But the appointment that Christ has received is an eternal, forever appointment after it says the order of Melchizedek as opposed to, if you will, the order of Aaron. The priesthood of Aaron came about, the old covenant priesthood as we know it came about, at least in terms of the chronology of the Bible, the ordering of the Bible, in about Exodus chapter 27, the end of it, and on into Exodus chapter 28, sometime after Israel was set free from Egypt and before they made it to the land of promise during that wilderness time. But do you know where Melchizedek's first mentioned in the Bible? Well before that. Genesis 14. And he's mentioned in connection with the story of uh, Abraham and Lot. And remember, Lot went somewhere he wasn't supposed to be and got caught up in a war and became a prisoner of war to these five kings that had joined together to win the war. It's the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and others. And so Abraham had to go fetch his nephew Lot. And he took his men and he commenced to whooping up on the five kings and their arrangement. And when God delivered him from that and brought back everyone that had been lost, including Lot, Abraham came back and it says he met a man named Melchizedek. And he acknowledged Melchizedek as his superior. He, he paid a tithe to him of what he had earned or what he had taken as the result of that victory. And then Melchizedek blessed him. Again, an indication that he was superior even to Abraham. That passage describes Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God. Wait a minute. When did the priesthood get started? So what we're talking about here is a different kind of priesthood, a different kind of priest. This is before the Old Covenant priesthood has begun. And one that would surely last after it, therefore. It also says about him in Genesis 14 that not only was he a priest... Anybody else know what other title he had? King. He was the king of Salem. Salem is what we now know as Jerusalem. So he was a priest and a king. Well, this wasn't true of any Old Testament, Old Covenant priest. But this was true of one character that's mentioned beyond Melchizedek in the Old Testament. Do you know who that character is? You've heard of him. The Messiah. The Messiah. The Christ that would come. The promised Savior. Verse 6 is a quote from Psalm 10, verse 4. It's a Messianic psalm. Now they all are, but this is an explicitly Messianic psalm. And it's one in which we see both the priestly and the kingly function of Christ. Now we see His priestly function in this part about Melchizedek, being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, but we see his kingly function in the mention or his equivalency to Melchizedek, who was also a king, but also in verse 1 of Psalm 110, which was quoted earlier in Hebrews 113, it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's about the kingly office of Christ. We studied not so long ago on Wednesday nights through the Minor Prophets when we got to the book of Zechariah. Do any of you remember, remember about the middle of Zechariah chapter 6 where it referred, it was talking about the Messiah and it spoke of Him as being the branch. And it said He would build a temple, but He would also establish a throne. That is, He would be a king and a priest. The phrase was a priest on his throne. That's why I say he's a superior priesthood. Because he has a superior appointment. Or as verse 10 repeats, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now there's one more way that we see the superiority of Christ over Aaron in the old covenant priesthood. And we see it in verses 7 through 9. 
Before we begin to read those verses, I'll go ahead and tell you what the way is. We see the superiority of Christ over Aaron and the Old Covenant priesthood because He has provided a superior result or superior results. Or I could say it like this. It maybe will help you understand it better. It does for me. Jesus as a priest is superior because He's provided a superior salvation. He's provided a superior righteousness. He's provided a superior forgiveness. Think about it in those terms. That's what I mean when I say He's provided a superior result. Now look at verse 7. It says, In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him who was able to save from death, and He was heard because of His reverence. Well, we see that Jesus received a superior result from His prayers, when it mentions Him here crying and praying out loudly and with tears, again, I think it's a reference to Gethsemane. What I talked about earlier. And His prayers were heard. And some might say, well, I don't know. He asked for the cup to pass from Him. And best I remember, it didn't pass from it at all. He had to drink every bit of it. But we're given more insight here in Hebrews chapter 5, and it says his prayer was ultimately that he would be saved or delivered from death. Now, for those of you who know the rest of the story, would you argue that Jesus was delivered or saved from death? Wasn't spared from it. He was saved from it. In the resurrection... Look at verse 8. It says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus had a superior result from his life when compared to the Old Testament priest. He suffered like they had, but the results from his suffering were superior. His was a superior obedience, which came about through suffering, even for him. Look at verse 9. It says, In being made perfect. That doesn't mean that He lacked perfection, but we talked about this in chapter 2, and I'll I'll reference it in just a little while. In chapter 2, we talked about it's not that Jesus lacked something. This is simply saying that apart from Him fulfilling all righteousness in His earthly life, that He wouldn't have been the perfect Savior. Well, again, it says in verse 9, and being made perfect through His obedience even in suffering, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. His was a perfect obedience. And the result of that was a superior salvation. And that's what I'm talking about when I say He provided a superior result, the sixth way. We see the superiority of Christ over Aaron and the Old Testament priesthood. How's the salvation He has provided described here? What word describes it? Eternal. Eternal salvation. What's that in contrast to that was provided, if you will, by the Old Testament priest? A temporal sort of salvation. A yearly sort of salvation, if you will. A weekly, a daily sort of salvation and forgiveness. Jesus, in contrast, has provided eternal salvation to all who obey Him. He's done it by His obedience for those who obey Him. Does that mean that we're saved by work? No. Where do we begin in obedience to the Lord? By repenting and believing. And then how do we demonstrate that we genuinely genuinely repent and believe? By following Christ in faith and obedience. Well, about this point, you may be wondering, what does this, what does the superiority of Christ over Aaron have to do with persevering? I thought that's what Hebrews was about. How would this have kept the original audience of Hebrews from falling away? How does it motivate us to endure 
Well, I'm glad you asked. The superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us to endure and to persevere for six reasons that I will cover in bullet form now, okay? So if you're a writer, limber up those fingers and write quickly. Though God has given me a voice that should be very easy to take notes from because I talk about it one-tenth of the speed of the normal voice. The superiority of Christ, or we could say that Christ is superior to the Old Testament priesthood, and it motivates us to persevere because Christ, our, check this out, Christ, our high priest, has passed through the heavens for us. For us. Go back to chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great or greater or superior high priest who has passed through the heavens, ascended to heaven, right hand of the Father, Jesus, the Son of God. Since that's the case, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold on to the faith. Let us hold on to Christ. Let us not fall away. He has ascended for us. He has made propitiation for us. He is seated and intercedes for us. John chapter 17 is called his high priestly prayer. Do you know what he prays for us there? Father, keep them. Keep them. Preserve them. So if He has done this for us, should we not persevere for Him? Should we not hold fast our confession for Him? Second reason, the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us to persevere is because Christ, our high priest, sympathizes with us. He sympathizes with us. Chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ is able to sympathize with us. Do you know why? Because as Strange as this may sound, especially when we consider the lofty, eternal position of Christ, He's one of us. He's one of us. And that means that He's gentle, not harsh. Brother and sister, if what keeps you apart from Christ is that you think that when you come to Him, you will find one who is like, why are you here again? I'm tired of you. You ought to be better than what you are. That's not the Christ of Scripture. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to Me. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My burden's light. My yoke is easy. Take up my yoke and learn from me, for I'm gentle. Spoke of himself as being humble in heart. He sympathizes with us. So we should endure with him. The third reason the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us to endure and persevere is because Christ, our high priest, gives access to us. Verse 16 again, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what He gives us access to? The throne of power. It is a throne of power, but that's not what it's called here. 
Do you know what keeps many from drawing near to the throne? Because we know what God is like. He is omnipotent God. He is powerful God. And when we think about God in those terms, it's not inviting when it comes to His throne. It creates, as it should, a sense of of awe, of, of biblical fear, of reverence toward God, and awareness of our own difference when it comes to the the, the comparison between us and God. But listen to the language here. So that we may draw near to the throne of grace. Does that sound inviting? The throne of grace? Don't you want to draw near? Don't you want to come close rather than run away from a throne like that? A seat like that? Jesus gives access to us, access to mercy, forgiveness for our sins if we confess them. Access to grace. Do you know how much grace God has? An inexhaustible amount. He heaps, He pours grace upon grace. James 4, 6 says there's always more grace. There's more grace than there is water in the oceans. It gives us access to grace, access to help. That's what it says. What do we need in this world, in this wilderness of life? What do we need? We need help. We need mercy for our sins. We need grace for the things that that we're dealing with for the things we need help on. And that's exactly what Jesus gives us access to. And this access gives us confidence, boldness, to draw near to a place we have no reason being. It's this confidence to draw near. So draw near, brother and sister. It's the way we persevere as we keep praying. It's one of the ways. That's how we draw near to the throne of grace. And this access is for us. So we persevere for Him. Fourth reason the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us is because Christ, our high priest, was appointed for us. That's what chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 talks about. Appointed to be a priest and a king as our priest and king. He mediates for us. And at the same time, He rules over us. So we continue for and with Him. A fifth reason the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us to persevere is because Christ, our high priest, is an example to us. He's an example in His prayer that was mentioned in verse 7, where He prayed with loud cries and tears, offering up supplications before God, for salvation, for help. And we find instruction there for dealing with our own wilderness experience. We do it through prayer. Christ is also an example to us in obeying and suffering as sons, which we are too. Verse 8 spoke about that. Although He was a son, He learned obedience through what was suffered. And this is a great correction to what's wrong in the theology of many Christians. We think that because we're children of God, then the suffering's all a part of the past. And what we really understand biblically is the suffering has just begun. Just look at our Savior Christ. He's not an example of how to get out of suffering. He's an example of how in this time to deal with and make it through suffering. As we understand that through the suffering, God has appointed the suffering so that we, as He, can learn to obey. That's the way it works even for sons. He's an example for us. So we endure for Him. And then a sixth reason we see, or a sixth reason the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament priesthood motivates us to persevere is because Christ, our high priest, is the source of salvation for us. And that's what we saw earlier in verse 9. To we who repent and believe. To we who follow Him in faith and obedience. To we who believe that He is both Savior and Lord. We do this. We persevere. 
We're motivated to endure whatever we face. And look, I know what you face. I know what many of you face, what you are facing. I'm not saying I've mastered it. I'm not saying I've even walked through, but I know about it and I, I hurt for you and I hurt with you. But we should keep going whatever it is. Because He has saved us. He is saving us. He will save us. He has given and He gives to us eternal life and He does it to us, for us. So we persevere for Him, for our superior high priest. This is one of those passages like many in the Bible that reminds us we can't get to God on our own and God help you if you think you can. We cannot get to God on our own. We need a mediator. We need a priest. And we need a better one than Aaron. We need a better one than the Old Testament, Old Covenant high priest. And we certainly need a better one than those that still carry that title of priest today. We need a better sacrifice than they can offer. We need a better representative. We need a better one with a better identity. We need one with better sympathy. One that offers better access. One that has a better appointment. One that provides a better result, a better salvation. We need a superior high priest. And the good news is, there is such a one as that. His name is Jesus. He's the Christ. So if you have not, turn from your sin and trust on Him for salvation, for forgiveness, for eternal life. He will save you. And after He saves you, He will help you all along the way. We just need to look to the superiority of Christ. Stand with me. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I would remind you that if there's anything that you ever need to talk with me about, I'd love to talk to you. If there's something from this message, from Hebrews, something that, that uh, from your life this week, I, I'd, I'd love to talk with you about it. Especially if you have doubts about where things are, where things stand between you and the Lord. Find me after the service. Come see me one day this week. Call me, text me. I'd love to talk with you about it, whatever it is. And I'm about to pray that God would help us to endure as we consider Jesus, our superior high priest. But before I do, I would remind you that we'll be online again tonight. I would also remind our deacons that we have our meeting in just a little while. And for those deacons that are uh, going to receive the offering, you can go ahead and make your way to the, to the four doors that exit the, the sanctuary. I'm glad you were here today. Let's pray. I prayed this earlier, Father, but again, I, I thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for showing us Christ. We praise You and worship Him because He is a superior high priest. In fact, He is just superior, period. And I pray that not one would miss that. And I pray that You would work through what we've read and studied today to motivate those who follow Christ even as we walk through the wilderness and hardships to carry on, to continue on. To Jesus who has gone before us. For Jesus who has gone before us. And I pray that you would use what we've read and studied to draw those who are apart from Christ to Him in repentance and faith that they 
might be saved by Him, the only Savior. We pray it all in His name. Amen. You're dismissed.